just what I mean You too, team, keep it clean You see my boy, he like got a made it Boy, that's my homie, ain't that right engraving You too, team, keep it clean What's going on, it's Engraving here with another video And another episode of NFL Questions from Subscribers A series where you can ask me any NFL question you want to and we answer it in a video just like this. Now, if you want to be part of it, you can send me an email to teamkeepitclean at gmail.com. Or for the patrons, you can send it directly on Patreon. Shout out to all the Team Keep It Clean patrons. Appreciate y'all. Team Keep It Clean, we have some very, very, very special guests in the building for this episode. So let me go ahead and let them introduce themselves. Team Keep It Clean, we got two special guests in the building from Be More Beatdown. Uh, and we got Ravens for Dummies, a.k.a. Spence. And we also have Jake Loke. So, fellas, go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Thanks for having us on. My name is uh, Jake Luke. I am a uh, writer, podcaster for BaltimoreBeatdown.com. And uh, this is my co-host, Spencer Spenny. Yeah, I likewise work with Baltimore Beatdown of SB Nation. We both write articles. We both host the podcast. Jake has uh, handled a lot more of the production side. And I previously worked with a company called Sports Info Solutions, I uh, spent a little time with PFF as well. So dive into the analytics world, dive into the, you know, the team to keep it clean, smiling world and all that good stuff. And uh, Jake and I, Jake and I keep our own dirty, but we're hashtag team keep it clean today. Yeah, for, for one day only. I appreciate it, man. So how, how did y'all get started uh, with doing exactly what you were doing, everything that you do? Uh, for uh, for me, go ahead, Jake. Yeah, thanks. So um, I started blogging for Baltimore Beattown in probably like 2016. I was still in college at the time. Um, mm -hmm. And I'd always like had the idea that I wanted to like do journalism or something like that, sports journalism specifically. Then I started taking some journalism classes and I realized I wanted nothing to do with like the uh, the minutia that goes into like being a journalist and like kind of all that stuff. So okay. I kind of realized that, you know, I was doing the whole blogging thing on the side anyway. So I'm just going to kind of go uh go full force into that and so uh i've since graduated been out of school for a couple of years kind of stuck with it over that time and um mm -hmm. you know after doing the blogging for a while there came an opportunity to start up a podcast um or at least just an opening to do so so i approached kyle barber who's our editor asked right. if i could do it and uh this this uh man to my uh right on my screen here just joined uh had just joined the website uh, a couple months prior and um I had just kind of a little inkling that he might be good on a pod. So I invited him to start hopping on with us. And uh, pretty much since then, that's that's sort of been the uh, the rest is history situation with uh, us two doing the pod. But uh, he's he's got a good story in his own right, I believe. Okay. Yeah, I, I know. You know, I just played football growing up my whole life. And, uh, you know, I, I was no no D1 athlete. And my arms aren't very long. I, uh, I ran I think I ran a 4840 at the Maryland State Combine at about 195 pounds. I don't think that's going to cut it. I tried real hard, uh, you know, did what I did, but I didn't want to go play. Uh, for me, D3 football and stuff like that was just didn't seem fun. And I uh, had a fun college experience. So Ravens fan my whole life. My mom, very blessed, uh, bought season tickets in 1996 when the Ravens came to town or back to town or whatever you want to call it. And uh, mm -hmm. she's, you know, provided since. So those were actually for my brother for babysitting me. They grew up and moved out. I was a little bit younger. And so I started going to games and I just – took to it and it got to the point, you know, where in college and in high school, I'd be writing, you know, Facebook posts that were like four paragraphs long about Joe Flacco and Terrence West and stupid stuff and sounding like a, like a dummy. And uh, ultimately I, I ended up going back to school at Towson university. I studied some electronic media and film and that got me into writing. I took some screenwriting classes and things like that. And I okay. saw on Twitter that, Kyle Barber wanted to hire some writers. So I jumped into Baltimore Beatdown. I had some social media professional experience. So I said I could help there too. And always been interested by the draft. So that uh, was was all good stuff. And it was a fun time starting up. And like Jake said, he asked me after a couple months, we started it. I think the first ever podcast we recorded, I actually recorded on my cell phone uh, in Ocean City in, in a room. We uh, just were throwing some some audio together and couple young bu young bucks figuring it out starting and playing around if you go back to our very first episode it probably sounds like ridiculous now i i, I need to do that soon but yeah, my, I, you know, I, even, I think we're doing I, okay now I'd, I'd give us like a six out of ten now we're we're, I, we're pretty decent yeah if we're a six out of ten now we're like a one out of ten and like that was me on the producing end so i i literally can't even go back and listen to those anymore like it's, <laughs> it's like nails on a chalkboard we all gotta start somewhere though yep, so, absolutely. Hey, and look where you are now now, speaking of looking where you are now, where can they look to find you now? Where, where, where can everybody find you at? Do it, Jake. Yeah, so you, you know what to do. 
Yep, you can find me on Twitter at Jake Luke. That is L O U Q U E, is how you spell my last name. Spencer is at Ravens Four Dummies. That's the number four in the middle. And you can follow our podcast account where we're tweeting out all sorts of content, memes, funny stuff, whatever strikes our fancy at Podcast Beatdown. You can also find it at Baltimore underscore Beatdown underscore Podcast on Instagram. And uh, it's just Baltimore Beatdown Podcast if you want to listen on uh, RSS feeds and YouTube. Okay, perfect. And my apologies because I said luck. When I look at it, I think lock on that goes on in my Dude, that's head. That's like honestly of the like the variations that I get on it, that is like not even <laughs> close to the most offensive or like wrong. So I honestly the fact that you got that close is good enough for me. <laughs> All right, I appreciate it. So uh, we got some great questions as we always do. So without further ado, let's get into these questions from subscribers. The first question came from my guy Martin M. He said, I ain't graven been watching the channel since February or March. Uh, I don't remember. I know we got off to a rocky start, but just wanted to let you know I really enjoy the content you put out for many years. I've always thought the Ravens fan base as the worst fan base in the NFL. Uh, they're always saying fire Harbaugh, fire Flacco, fire this guy, fire that guy, whoever, even going as far as threatening kids because they didn't get who they wanted. Uh, that's a shame for any Ravens fans that would do that. Uh, but anyway, he said, I just wanted to thank you for all the positivity uh, that you've been showing uh, and it's nice to know that there are still positive Ravens fans these days. Anyway, my question for you is, since I'm newer to the channel, what are some of your favorite plays other than the Flacco Hail Mary? The one for me is Torrey Smith's game-winning touchdown versus Pittsburgh in 2011, 2012. I don't remember. Somewhere in that area. I have trouble remembering the whole games and what year they were. Sorry for another long question slash comment. So what are you, some of your favorite Ravens moments from over the years? Mine, uh, just to start off, it would be that same exact one. I believe that was from the 2011-12 season uh, on Sunday Night Football where Torrey Smith caught that game-winning touchdown because that's the year that we swept Pittsburgh because I think week one we played them and it was like 35-7. to seven. And, and the Steelers, they had like as many turnovers as points in that, get, that week one game. But – so those two would probably be two of my favorite moments. What about you? I'd say for me, one of my favorite that I think is uh, one that gets lost in translation a little bit would be 2003. I want to say it was late November. Ravens Seahawks at home. Mr. Anthony Wright was the quarterback. The Ravens trailed by, I want to say, 24 at one point in that game. And ultimately ended up winning the game 44 to 41 on a 55 yard Matt Stover field goal. Man, the Ravens really have been blessed with kickers. Mm -hmm. But that was a really fun game. I believe uh, Anthony Wright connected with uh, Marcus Robinson wow. three times in the fourth quarter, if I'm not mistaken. Ed Reed blocked a punt and took it back 16 yards. Uh, the Ravens threw a touchdown with a minute and 12. And it drew Baltimore all the way back to 41-38, something along those lines. Uh, the Seahawks, it got to the point where the Seahawks, it was fourth down, I remember, and it was really crazy because the entire stadium had left already. There was maybe 10, 20,000 fans left. The Ravens were getting blown out. You know, right. Anthony Wright was playing. He was a backup. Mm -hmm. And all the fans came storming back in in the fourth quarter. <laughs> I think it was one of the loudest, I've, loudest occasions I've ever heard it there. And Matt Hasselback tried to do a quarterback sneak with like a minute left, which would have sealed the game. And I think Ray Lewis kind of came up and popped him and a couple linemen got back there and popped him and uh, that, that gave them the chance to go tied. And then, like I said, they hit that game winning field goal. So that was really cool for me. I think I was about 10 years old at the time. So that was one younger memory for me that really stuck out. And I think that if you've never watched that game or, or looked up the highlights of that game, you should, it was, it was incredible. So that was, that was definitely one for me. How about you, Jake? Yeah, we did the uh, we did the Anthony Wright playoff game. We rewatched that recently, didn't we, last year? Um, so yeah. I, I definitely remember looking into that a little bit. That's a good pick. Uh, for me, I think a lot about, um, and this isn't like totally out of left field, but 2018, week 17 against the Browns. Um, oh. I, that was that was a big one for me because I kind of just graduated college, and as like a uh, I want to say a Christmas gift to my brother and my dad, I bought them their first ever tickets to Ravens games, and like they had grown up, my dad taking me. Uh, you know, with my brother, obviously he would buy the tickets and they would, they would kind of take me and they sort of got me into tailgating culture and really got me into the Ravens. So kind of buying them tickets, you know, for Christmas that year, was a lot of fun, uh, mm -hmm. up the nosebleeds, but you know, who's, who's counting that, you know, what, what does that matter as long as the, uh, the thought is there. So we, uh, oh. yeah, we get there and, um, we actually got in a little late. Jimmy Smith, like snags an interception while we're walking to our seats. So like we hear that going on, it's, it's pandemonium throughout the stadium. It winds up mm -hmm. being 
awesome, awesome game. Lamar Jackson just running up and down through that uh, that Cleveland defense. And um, it's sort of funny because it, it mirrored in a lot of ways what had happened the prior year with the same team in the same stadium, same week, same stakes, trying to make the playoffs with a win. And obviously you're playing a different team with the Bengals and the Browns, but right. kind of you're fearing the exact same thing is going to happen again. Mm-hmm. And I will never forget the feeling sitting mm-hmm. up in those seats uh, – when Baker Mayfield takes the field and it's like, Oh God, it's, it's going to happen again. And I promised I wasn't going to swear here, but you know, there were, there were some things going through my mind about what was going to happen uh, on that field when, uh, when Baker ran out there, but um, CJ Mosley forces the pick. And that was probably yes. Spencer put out there recently. What's the loudest you've heard the stadium in the past five years. I think it's without yes. question. It's gotta be that game. That's exactly what I was getting ready to say too. As soon as I heard you talk about that game, that that is the loudest Ravens game I've ever been to because the stadium, like, it was literally, literally shaking. Um, I remember putting my camera in the cup holder and the camera, it just kept falling because the stadium was so loud and it was just shaking like crazy. So, yeah, that, that 2018 game was crazy. Um, I got to go back and rewatch that 2003 game uh, from the Ravens and the Seahawks. I, I was just actually watching the uh, 2003 playoff game with the Ravens and the Titans um, a couple of days ago. So, yeah, that, that reminded me of what you were just talking about. The next question came from my guy, Lee P. He said, blessings to you and your family. What I'm about to say will not be a popular take, but so be it. I believe Proche, James Proche, JP, will not only make the squad, but should be considered for the wide receiver three position behind Watkins and Hollywood Brown. Yes, ahead of rookie Rashad Bateman. NFL players have always said they can tell if a player is good based off practice. Well, Proche is killing it in practice so far. Most improved player by far. Could he be that diamond in the rough that this passing game needed all along? <laughs> what are your thoughts? Spencer, I'll let you start with this one because I know you've been getting that bird's eye view to a uh, training camp recently. So you've been getting to see him up close and personal. Definitely. Um, to me, James Proche is the type of player that, he at his best, you know, if he if his career was to turn out to be as best as he possibly could have it go, I see him like a and you know he's not a great guy off the field right now, but I see him like kind of like a Cole Beasley type mm-hmm. player who is just a, a you know one of the better or most effective slot receivers in the game. Uh, Proche might be able to do a little bit more damage on the outside than Cole Beasley can do, but ultimately you want him running some option routes, some slants, some choice routes, some quick hitters. I think he has the best hands on the team by far when you're at practice and receivers are running through drills, or if you hear Marlon Humphrey try or make an interception, you know, Marlon Humphrey's hands hit the ball. You hear James Proche catches the ball. You hear nothing because his hands are so soft. I like to say the man could win a egg toss competition out to 50 yards. You could bomb him, you know, a nice organic free range cage free uh, Dr. Magic or uh, farmer Brown, egg from the zero all the way to the 50 and you you know he would just cup that thing perfectly i think that he has the best hands on the team i think he's a tough tight window contested catch receiver in terms of generating separation you know i i don't see him being an antonio brown type or anything like that but i think he could make a nice career for himself as a slot receiver and as things stand if he continues to do 80 percent of what he's done in the first couple practices here i guess we're about eight nine practices in then you're going to see a player who in this offense that, you know, take it in, into consideration. They don't throw the ball all that much. Right. Let's say they, you know, throw another 50, 60 passes this year. Uh, is kind of what I'm, I'm starting to project. Not a ton more, but a good bit. I think he could be a, a 25, 30, 35, maybe even 40 catch guy, depending on, you know, injuries and other situations and be a reliable target over the middle. So James Roche, I think, is going to carve out a nice career for himself as a slot receiver and is a starting caliber slot. Now, do you think that um, – because Lee's other question was, do you think he should leapfrog Rashad Bateman? And Because and, I, I – uh, I, me, that's a no. But do you think he should leapfrog Rashad Bateman as far as playing time? There's a lot of different takes on, you know, who, what, when. And when you're out at practice, you see Devin Duvernay. The Ravens are basically using in two ways right now. They're using him as a flanker, which is going to be a very – far perimeter towards the boundary receiver that is off the line of scrimmage. Usually you want faster guys that can threaten the defense vertically, draw safeties out into space to open things up underneath. It's also guys who maybe aren't the best with dealing with press. That's going to be, you know, your Batemans, your walk-ins. So that's going to be the other side of the field, the guys who are on the line of scrimmage. So I think that, you know, 
seeing them use Duvernay as someone who's going to come in motion a lot, someone who's going to get some screens, some handoffs, some manufactured touches underneath versus James Prochet, who's probably going to be, you know, on the line of scrimmage or off the line of scrimmage closer to the formation and working between the numbers. So, you know, Hollywood Brown, probably going to get a lot of time in the slot too. Mark Andrews plays a ton in the slot. Josh Oliver looks like he's going to play in the slot. Sammy Watkins and Rashad Bateman, both Rip Bateman in college and Watkins and, you know, his previous tenures with the Chiefs and the Bills, uh, as well as the Rams, is used in the slot too. So Prochet definitely is on the pecking order, but where he stands is is TBD, but he's definitely playing himself into playing time. Yeah, I liked, uh, I liked James a lot when they made that pick, probably more so than a lot of people. Um, it's kind of gone... I wouldn't say I haven't, you know, gone back on that in the last couple months, but uh, I think it was always framed as like him versus Miles Boykin to make the roster. And I think just kind of looking at it rationally, like Miles Boykin's size, speed combo, his blocking ability, some of his production too, to be fair, he scored a decent amount of touchdowns in the last couple of years. I just thought that Boykin was for sure going to have the upper hand, but yeah. at the last couple, you know, days, week and a half, whatever of practice have shown anything. I think I said this on the show the other day that, it seems like James Pro- Prochet is like more than the sum of his parts. You know, he's kind of a smaller guy, but he, he makes it work. And Miles Boykin, unfortunately, kind of has shown himself to be less than the sum of his athletic parts at times. And uh, I think that's unfortunate because I, I think Miles is a, a good dude with a, a ton of potential. But as of right now, I think James is, uh, I don't know about like the third receiver, but I definitely think he has a spot on this roster. And um, the way that he's developed already from like a sixth round pick who basically didn't do much of anything as a receiver, as a rookie to what he's doing in training camp right now. I don't see why he couldn't continue to develop and crack into the rotation. Maybe at some point this year. Mm, Okay. And um, something that you touched on uh, as far as what he's doing in training camp this year, uh, it does make a big difference because they actually have a training camp this year because him and Duvernay, they they didn't get to have that last year. Uh, And now with them adding Sammy Watkins, Bateman, uh, Wallace, and then of course Hollywood and Boykin being back as well. Uh, that that competition in, in training camp is that much better. Uh, so we're going to see soon who ends up making it. we got, what, about a month left, and then they got to trim that roster down to 53. So Ravens, uh, hopefully, um, they have some tough decisions to make, and the decisions aren't made based off of who's available health-wise. Hopefully that's not what makes the decisions. Hopefully the decisions are made as hard as possible, uh, and all those boys just bring it. Shout out to Graven.